Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for January the 8th, 2021. This is episode number 40. Today, we'll be talking about the Porsche Taycan breaking the cannonball record. Apple is talking with Hyundai about autonomous EVs. Um, the Tesla Model Y standard range and third row has just launched. I'm Dominic Kioni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Malogny, Inside EVs editor and host of the YouTube channel State of Charge with Tom Malogny. We also have Martin Lee with us from the EV News Daily podcast, which is available on all your usual podcast platforms. And of course, Kyle Connor joins us from the Out of Spec Studios family of YouTube channels. He also puts together the absolutely marvelous videos for the Inside EVs YouTube channel. Go subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. Uh, okay, so welcome, uh, gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience to our first regular news show of 2021. Of course, we did the show last week uh, on New Year's Day, taking a look at the cars coming this year. And if you haven't seen that, go give it a look-see later on. But this week, ahead, uh, ahead of the news, we have a couple interesting things to talk about. So let's start with you, Tom. Um, let's see. I understand that you have tested out an adapter that can charge a Tesla at a CCS fast charge station. Uh, want to tell us about it? Yes, I have. Look at this beautiful, small, elegant beauty. <laughs> it's a monstrosity, isn't it? But it right. actually worked for me. Now, I know um, some other people have just re received this. This just came out. SeaTech Power in China makes this and uh, just became available and uh, shipped out right, right before Christmas. And many people that got them said they didn't work. They tried them. But I went to Electrify America station and plugged it in with my Model 3, and it worked. Uh, it didn't deliver the amount of power I was hoping it to, but my state of charge was high at the time. Uh, it was at 70%. I was only able to pull somewhere around 43 kilowatts. Should have been pulling a little bit higher at 70%, but I really need to do a full charge test where I drain the car down uh, and then uh, and, and charge it from, from zero. I also was able to drive over to a charge point, uh, 24 kilowatt DC fast charger, the, the charge point express 100s and use that. And it worked there also. Now, I just recently used it a couple days ago on a Blink DC fast charger, 50 kilowatt made by ABB, and it didn't work. So that was my first fail. Uh, but on the Electrify America and ChargePoint networks, it plugged in, immediately initialized, and worked. So, uh, you know, we're finally going to have this option here in the U.S. like Europe's had for quite some time now. Uh, but we'll be able to charge Teslas on CCS DC fast chargers with this or the upcoming Tesla adapter. Tesla's making one of these. They already started selling it in uh, South Korea. And very soon, from what I understand, it's gonna be available for North America also. So how much, does it, how much did this one cost? <laughs> so I paid the discounted price of $660 for this unit. Um, right. they, they had a special going on for the first right. 1,000 buyers. And now it's back to its regular price of nine hundred and eighty dollars. So a lot this, of money. Is, this is not something that the casual Tesla owner is going to buy and just throw it in their trunk and say, oh, well, maybe I'll need this thing. No, this does have a use. And there are going to be people that want an adapter like this and would be willing to pay for it. You know who you are. You know, if you travel in areas where there aren't a lot of superchargers and or maybe just you know, you want that added extra convenience, but this isn't something that, you know, we're saying, oh, if you own a Tesla, go out and buy. Uh, first of all, wait for Tesla to offer their adapter, which should be coming soon. See right. what the price is. And then I have a hunch that if Tesla sells their CCS adapter for somewhere around what they sell the Chatamo adapter for, $400, $500, I think you'll see SeaTech Power then dramatically lower the price of this unit, uh, only because they wouldn't sell any of them if, if you could buy one from the manufacturer for right. half the price that you're selling yours for. And, and you know, it doesn't cost them that much to make it. it maybe it's cost them some money to, you know, do the research to put it together and everything. Um, yeah. So what's the maximum charge you can get with that? Well, it says it can accept 200 amps. So right. it should, it should be able to get, you know, 
close to double what I was getting. Um, but I haven't been able to confirm that yet. I haven't been able to charge it because shortly after I got the adapter, uh, well, I, I just got it a couple weeks ago, but my car's now back at Tesla service. When I, this is my new 2021 model three. And when I received it, there were some issues with it. And I had to make a service appointment with Tesla for them to correct some things. And it, they have the car now, they still have it. So I don't have it back yet. I can't test it out and really see how it works at a lower state of charge. I have a big problem with this adapter and it is not just the price. The price is the big thing here, but 200 amps at 400 volts. First off, is really not going to be possible on a model three is 80 kilowatts. So that's like ideal best case. But when the packs at 400 volts, you're at 80% state of charge charging right. and the car limits to 50 uh, kilowatts. Right. So you're really only going to get seventies best case. And so now you're spending a thousand dollars nearest makes no difference. Uh, plus charging cost at EA. It's not like it's free. Like some Tesla's have superchargers and, and you're only getting 70 kilowatt. Like I'll just use my Chatmo adapter and Mo, oh, I'm at 50 kilowatts. Uh, you know, it just doesn't make sense, but right. we have to applaud Tom for buying this thing for all of us to see because True. it doesn't make any sense, but he still bought it. But other, other people have bought it too, and it's not working for them. Or a lot of people have had some fails. I'm not sure. Have you heard of any successes, Tom? Uh, quite honestly, I just saw one person on Twitter uh, post okay. that they got it and it works. Um, that was it. And then a slew of people that said it doesn't work. Now, you can update this uh, connector. Uh, underneath there, there's a port where you can plug in. And from what I understand, some of the people that contact, I'll see if you can see it here. Yeah. Down there, yeah. So okay. some of the people that, that have complained to the company that it doesn't work received uh, a, 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 a software update uh, that I guess they plugged it into their computer and was, was able to update it. I don't know. I haven't heard back from them yet to see if it works, but um, I know you can. Uh, they they can send you software updates for it. But, you know, this, this isn't like we said, and, you know, I, I totally get where Kyle's coming from. Uh, this 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 isn't for everybody and neither was the right. Chatamo adapter, uh, you know, and, and the only thing that I think that, uh, that I would maybe suggest getting this over the Chatamo adapter, maybe not right now, but once the price goes down is that there's a lot with the Lexify America. Now there's going to be a lot more CCS plugs available. And the, quite honestly, the Chatamo uh, adapter on many, uh, DC fast chargers had communication problems. I know I've heard, talked to so many people that on Electrify America, they had problems trying to connect. And I don't think it's something that Electrify America and the other networks spent a lot of time working on. Now, you know, uh, uh, this is just my guess. I, I haven't received anything because there's there's so few cars that use Chatamo now uh, and, and are going to use Chatamo that I think it's kind of just the stepchild and they're not going to spend a lot of time trying to make sure everything works with Chatamo. Um, so I think that in that regard, it's this this would be the connector moving forward to use on Tesla once we get them at a reasonable price and they work. Right on. Well, that's cool. Uh, so, well, that's pretty exciting. Kyle here has some, also uh, has had some pretty crazy adventures himself, and he is now the electric vehicle cannonball record holder, having beaten some dude in a Tesla Model 3 who also happens to go by the name of Kyle Connor. Uh, so, I uh, want to uh, want want to give us a a, a look at. Uh, just tell us about your trip, how long it took, uh, the spec of the car, maybe your, your experience with the Electrify America chargers that you used. Sure. Well, a uh, lot, lots to unpack there. We'll have tons of content on our side, sort of walking through everything. We haven't even tallied up all the numbers yet. Uh, but right through the new year, we left on December 31st, arrived on the 1st, left New York City in a Porsche Taycan 4S uh, and arrived in Los Angeles 44 hours, 25 minutes and 59 seconds later, which is the quickest time to cross the country uh, ever in an electric vehicle uh, on the Cannonball route. And I believe actually even on any non-traditional route, but uh, yeah, it is the, um, it is the uh, electric vehicle record holder, this, this Taycan 4S. And uh, we beat a Tesla model three long range rear wheel drive that my friend Matthew and I set last year, year and a half ago. 
Uh, and that's big news. You know, look, we could have done another Tesla run and no one would have cared. And neither would I, because like, sure, you can make a Tesla incrementally go faster. I knew we left time on the table. I knew we got stuck in traffic. Uh, I knew we optimized our charging really well. There's been, I think, 10 or 12 attempts, uh, not from us, but from you know other people to break our Model 3 record. But I really wanted to push the CCS public networks, uh, showcase the Taycan as a great road tripper, uh, but also yeah. showcase like you can actually get around on CCS, or at least this was the theory, right. uh, and, and we've proven it. And, and here we go, 4425 is the new time. Uh, I did it with my my good friends, Timon Schreer and Drew Peterson. And uh, Drew owns Martian Wheels. Timon is our videographer here at Out of Spec. And uh, just a great team. Three of my close friends ripping across the country in a Porsche. It doesn't get any better. So how much quicker was it than your other record? What was the time difference? Right. Uh, about 50 minutes, 5-0. Uh, okay. So the other one was 45-16. This one's 44-25. So what, what do you think you made up that time? Well, actually, we had a couple things on this run that helped us. Uh, the first were spotters along the way. So we had crazy guys like Tom shooting ahead of us. Uh, not that Tom was involved in any way whatsoever, no, of course. No, and, uh, speeding <laughs> or anything like that. Right, right. Tom drove at the speed limit in the Model 3, uh, scanning for road hazards, you know, uh, right. and basically Trailer made hitches. sure that... Yeah, made sure that we had a great run across the country, uh, or, or at least out of New York through New Jersey. And then uh, we had this across the country. So speed uh, 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 spotters helped with driver confidence. We had a ton of things against us. The Porsche was actually the root of most of the charging issues. Electrify America had a couple glitches with starting stations and handshakes and post failures uh, here or there. Uh, nothing that a quick move couldn't fix, but the Porsche had some serious problems uh, with charging protocols. And the way I look at this is it's Porsche's Volkswagen Group, Electrify America's Volkswagen Group. So there's yep. one finger to point here. It's the Volkswagen Group. It should just plug and charge every single time. There's no excuse. Yes. Um, so that is frustrating, but we worked our way around it. We started to figure out why we were having some of the problems we were having on Signet branded chargers, specifically the earlier Signets when the Tycon had a red hot battery, when it can accept maximum power, uh, it would forget to send the line of code that it can only take 270 kilowatts and the chargers were throwing 270, 80, 90 at the car. And, and then it was like, Hey guys, that's a little too much. I got to stop charging. So, um, the car kept cutting off our charging session. So what we had to do was pull in with a colder battery pack. So it was thermal throttling just a bit, and then right. it would ramp up throughout the charging session to the maximum speed. So we learned these things along the way. We certainly left some time on the table and we did it in the middle of winter, but that's the big thing here. We did right. it with software glitches in the middle of winter on a supposedly unreliable charging network, right? And right. we just proved to everyone that that we got across the country faster than a Tesla in optimal conditions. And that was the story I wanted to tell. Not anything against Tesla. I own Tesla, you, know, you guys know I love my Tesla, but I hate it when Tesla owners say, nice e-tron, how are you gonna get it out of the driveway? Well, right. here's your clear. That is kind of annoying. Like a lot of people like to, they like to, right. Some people are very enthusiastic about the brand and that's great and everything, but you know, there's other brands and there's a whole lot of electric vehicles and, and charging networks out there that, you know, well, this, are just the wars. this is, this is the start of the wars. Now it's, you know, I, I actually think our time would be to long range plus model S there's only version two superchargers across the country. I think only two of them are version threes. So until Tesla updates their network, they're not going to hold the cannonball records for time to come. Lucid's just going to smack them down hardcore then it's going to be semi right because right. mega chargers right and right. uh then so who knows mega it's going to be interesting i may not do another one uh probably no need to do another one people are already enthused enough to do it i just want to see the technology pushed but i don't think right. anyone else was trying to tell the ccs story uh or the the electrify america story in the way we wanted it to be told which is why we did the run yeah, you know, a lot of people are critical of cannonball runs because, uh, you know, if you do have an internal combustion car and you're trying to set the record, that record is a lot sh uh, shorter time. So people have to drive a lot faster. So it's very dangerous. I checked in a few times and um, it's sometimes, you know, you're below the speed limit. Some, but, and every time you were below 100 miles an hour, um, which, you know, it was like clear 
clear. I mean, maybe you exceeded that at some points. I have no idea, but um, yeah, we're not talking yeah, when about I, when I checked in, I, I saw, you know, look, the, oh, the electric runs. Uh, the, yeah. I, you know, I'm all about safety. Right. And it, I know that sounds weird coming from me, but I'm with my two good friends in the car. We have right. a Porsche press vehicle. We're not here to put anything, anyone, any, any, part of this trip at risk uh you know one accident kills the entire trip so so we have to be very careful about where we put down the speeds when we're able to um you know is it a safe place to do so um and, and this is this is a whole strategy of of cannonballing eventually the electric runs are going to turn into much higher and higher speeds across the country uh consistently because right. you know in, in the runs now you kind of pop it up and then you're like okay i burned a little too much juice let me pull it down um, once you get massive charging speeds and really close distances, you're going to have to drive like a madman to just right. get across the country. And at that point, I'm probably not that interested. At least right. now it's more of a technology pusher um, and a test of the the charging networks across the country. And the Taycan was a great car to do it in. That thing, uber comfortable. I don't know why EPA rates that car so low. We were exceeding EPA range in five degree temperatures, climbing over the Rockies at not speed limit speeds. Like it's so wrong, EPA speeds. I do not understand why. And um, yeah, it, w- it was a great trip and a cool story. So so once again, the spec on that, it was, it's a Porsche Taycan 4S on 18 inch wheels with the aero covers and that has a the large battery in it, right? So so there's no aero covers. It, it is the aero wheels, but they're 19s. Yeah, 19. so, so 19 inch oh, aero wheels and um, big battery thermal glass, which was actually great because it had the double pane glass, kept the heat in the cabin pretty well. Um, It is an option. Yeah, it's like $1,200. We had the passenger display, which would have been cool, but the navigation system in the car had no idea where we were. So we couldn't actually precondition the battery for fast chargers. If, but we wanted to precondition the battery to fast chargers near where the car thought it was, which was Ohio. Mm -hmm. However, we also (laughs) didn't have cell connectivity into the car. And because we didn't have cell connectivity, it defaulted all the chargers to 100 kilowatts in the system but it will only precondition if it's more than 145. However, this worked out to our advantage because we actually needed a cold battery in order for it to charge at 350 kilowatt stations because if we plugged in with a hot battery, it would take too much power and break the charging session. So it worked out. Man. That's so can, can this record be be- beaten by a, by a Tesla now? If they, did, if they didn't hit traffic or whatever? Yeah, traffic's probably not the big thing here. It, it's all about optimizing your charging. And we've seen attempts okay. from long range plus Model S's and they haven't even come close. Um, okay. You know, and but I don't think they really did a good job of optimizing. I don't know. Sure, anything's able to be beaten. Yeah, I think you probably could do it. But like at that point, we already know a Tesla can get across the country that quickly. Like I'm not going to go yeah. and do it in a long range plus just to try and get the time down 10 minutes. Like that's a lot of wasted effort for really no one cares we already know you can do it until you can break 40 hours that's going to be the next big thing to get it in the 39 something and that's lucid territory based on the current charging infrastructure right right um so i got to drive this actual test this tycon a little bit myself on some straight roads on highways at at the speed limit actually and i just want to say it man feels good to drive it's really you know just comfortable you, everything just feels right you know it's oh, it just feels good uh, a, freaking, else wanted, uh, yeah. a bank vault of a car isn't it it just sits and yeah. cruises and the faster you go the more stable it is it's built for auto bonds and what built a car to speed. do a cannonball in built for speed no question that thing's a machine and we didn't even have like any performance options this was old man spec luxury road tripper and oh, yeah, uh, grand touring like oh man i could you could I, I just felt like i could drive all all day all night in that and uh, like you like you did yeah well to celebrate after the run we took it up to angeles forest and teared up the tour up the canyons all day so like we weren't tired of driving <laughs> our right. celebration was to drive the porsche nice nice anyone have any questions for uh, kyle I, I was wondering when you're pulling how often did you um, roll into the charging station, like say under 5%. Very often. Very often. So you were really trying to time it to get that state of charge down as low as you could. 
yeah, targeted uh, was 3%. And if we had buffer, which 3% still buffer, we would try and burn it up as speed. Wow. Cool. Because it just charges so quickly. But but again, that's we, the trick. That's the trick. You just got to pull in dead with the Tycon, ride that wave up to 45, 50%. As soon as it yeah. tapers below 200 kilowatts, it's like, can I make it to the next station? Right. If yes, leave immediately because you'll get higher speeds at the next station. If right. no, then you have to hang out just until you can make it there. And yeah, you can't judge that wrong because you can't, you know, run out too soon or you're really screwed. If you're like power limited. We had a couple, <laughs> couple sections where we had to back off the speed. You know, we're getting like 30 miles away and the range estimates like okay. 24 miles to get there. So we're like, oh, well, let's Ooh. just back off. And it's a guesso meter. So you can increase the range of right. your EV by driving more slowly. It's very simple. It's easy for us. Like we're used to it. Uh, and you? the Tycon. Sorry, Martin, go ahead. Uh, so but in terms of the battery temperature, how did you measure and manage that? So in the driver instrument cluster, there's a little gauge you can pull up, which is an average temperature reading of the cells across the whole pack. And wow. at, uh, which is great that the Tycon has a battery temperature gauge. And the only way we could manage the temperature because we had no way to force warm up or cool was with the accelerator pedal. Uh, so if we needed it warm, foot to the floor. If we needed it cool, back off a little bit. And even though that battery has a pretty big thermal mass, you would think the temperature swings were fairly quick, quicker than I've seen in most EVs. I was pretty uh, surprised by that. Hmm, interesting. Right on. All right. So, so we got, let's get some news now. So uh, last night, uh, Tesla made some news. They have launched officially the uh, Model Y standard range, as well as the optional third row. So you can now get a seven-seater uh, midsize Tesla crossover SUV. Um, let's see. So someone asked Elon Musk actually back in July if uh, the SR model, the, sh the uh, standard range Model Y would even be made and because the configuration page was taken down. And he replied, no, as its range would be unacceptably low less than 250 miles EPA. Well, apparently uh, you don't you should not believe Elon Musk every 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 statement he makes because uh, you know, it's it's here. And let's see. So, uh, the price is $41,990. Uh, the the Model Y standard range is a single motor rear wheel drive crossover. It's zero to 60 is 5.3 seconds and a top speed of 135. And the third row is a $3,000 option. And it looks pretty tight. What do you think, Martin? Ooh, uh, yeah, let's let's bring up a picture of, uh, of that third row. Um, so there's a so the video from Robert uh, Tesla daily uh, has got some pictures. I don't know how official or, or not these are, whether it's leaked or or, or this is from the, the site. It's the first time I've seen Rob's uh, video, but it's it's a squeeze back there. I mean, yeah. the, uh, the, the 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 jump seats in the old Model S configuration um, is a squeeze. So to put these two and they're forward facing as well. Um, and I'm going to be really interested in in just seeing it in in action when those YouTube videos hit of of how you move the second row and how that impacts the third row because when that second row is all the way back, there is it must be it must be touching the seats. So right. in order to get two kids in the back, you must have to move the middle row forward. So that really is two adults, two kids, or three kids, two kids. Um, right. But looking forward to looking forward to seeing that standard range. Super interesting, loving the debate because those of a certain persuasion will say, "Well, there's no demand," so Elon's had to go back on his word, and right. uh, and and you know, and now yeah. uh, now they're just releasing this because nobody's buying cars any, you know, Teslas anymore, um, right. and uh, and those of another persuasion will say, "This is more proof that the richest man in the world uh, is a genius because it's a new financial year and they just had a great Q4 and now they're launching this demands off the charts and." And uh, you 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 decide uh, which one you subscribe to, right? Well, they did have a great Q4. They uh, and they hit their just about hit their five hundred thousand uh, deliveries for twenty twenty, and they produced over over five hundred thousand. I think ten thousand more, five hundred and eight thousand or nine thousand or something. So they did hit those those uh, pretty ambitious goals. Um, yeah, 
Kyle, what do you think about this car? This is not bad or what? Eh. I mean, like, who's going to want to sit back there? You're going to want to put your right. least favorite children in the back, but then you're going to have to <laughs> stuff them in the back and deal with them as you're calling them out. I mean, like, I don't have kids, but that doesn't look great. Um, also, like, your head's right on the glass roof. Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm not one to question Tesla safety. I'm not going to go there, but it just seems a little tight. And uh, I don't know. I just, and the standard range, cool. I'm a big fan of small battery cars. I, I don't know why this wasn't out earlier. Elon's claim where every car needs 300 miles or whatever it is, that's silly. Uh, actually, I think we will, and we can debate this on another show, I really think we will see a trend towards smaller battery, shorter range uh, EVs coming within the next five, six, seven years once charging infrastructure becomes uh, everywhere. And, and for the most part, the standard range Model Y is going to be more than enough range for anyone. So I'd say that's the one to buy. Save yourself seven, $8,000, whatever it is. And sure. uh, that seems like the deal of the century. But I would totally skip the third row option. That just looks unnecessarily uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, a third, this third row might work out for, you know, specific circumstances. You've got like four or five kids and, you know, they they can fit in the middle row with a with, with it move forward for the back row, you know, but obviously not everyone's going to want this. And yeah, there's other options they can use, but I, I really like the, the standard range. I like the rear wheel drive. Like that's what I would buy because I'm, I live in Florida and I don't need all wheel drive uh, at all. And the zero to 60 time is 5.3 seconds. That's, that's quick. That's still plenty quick. That's like, I think that the, the Volkswagen ID4 GTX, which I believe is uh, going to be launched this year, is like the performance spec of the ID4. It doesn't do, it does like six seconds. So this is even, yeah, this is like this the is lowest than Y, and it's still quicker than, quicker than the rest. Yeah. That's but, a really uh, good yeah. point about, it's a good point about the speed, because if you haven't gone 0 to 60 in five seconds recently, well, look, a lot of roads over here are 60 mile an hour speed limit certainly the national speed limit is 70 here on our on our main motorways and so within five seconds you're very close to points on your license and so uh, how much performance do you need anything more just makes your passengers feel sick if you know if you're not careful with your right foot so five seconds to seven seconds is probably a real sweet spot for most people who don't want to <laughs> concentrate on driving because frankly i drive teslas in chill mode it, otherwise, it's just too much. Like it's too much effort. I'm just I'm a lazy when I'm going around town doing chores. I'm a lazy driver. I don't want to be constantly thinking, oh my passengers. Like my wife gets a lot of car sickness and stuff. And otherwise, yeah. real performance cars. Why you just don't need it? I've, Tesla are always going to make those cars to get bragging rights. But well, five point five point three seconds is really quick. Go back twenty years really and quick. look at hot hatches and GTIs and you know, performance cars and go back 30 years and look at Ferraris and like five seconds is right. a dream. So, you know, it's, right. it's all you need. Sure. Yeah. When I'm driving alone, my, my car does what? 7.3 seconds. I think zero to 60. And if I'm alone, I can, I, I still punch it even at that because it just feels so good with, you know, their space and everything's safe. It just, it feels so good. They feel that thing just pull from like, you know, 20 to 40 or whatever. And yeah. So I would take the I would take this. This would be my Model Y if I was buying, and that's plenty of range for me too. That gets me to the beach and back, no problems. You got the supercharger, right? Well, I look, you know, I'm like a hundred miles from the beach, and when I was growing up, we were like a hundred miles from the from the city where all, my, all all of my other relatives lives. So I always think of, you know, I was I always want to be able to go a hundred miles and then come back without worrying about charging. Just in my mind, that's like a good number, and and this does it. So here's the question. Yeah. Maybe it doesn't. We don't know for sure how well okay. it'll match EPA range. Well, we should find out. Oh, we, we will. We will, for sure. Here's a question I have. When Elon posted that response on Twitter um, that it's not going to be made, did he know that it was going to be made later on and he just didn't want people holding off and waiting for them to offer that. He wanted everybody to order the their Model Ys now so so 2020 would have, you know, the best sales that he could and hit his targets. Or did was there an internal argument over this and then they decided to go and sell this? Did he know all along that this was going to be offered? That's that's my question. I think he did. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And but you know what? They want to prioritize sales of higher spec models right. anyway. 
So they'll make more money on the dual motor. And so for him dissing the base ones, like, great, you know, they'll offer it for those people, but they'll make more money on a dual motor. I agree that. And I, and I understand the need to prioritize the higher profit items, but I also think that that's a bit disingenuous. If there's somebody that really wanted yes. this, the, the, the standard range and uh, they've been saving for it and, you know, they, once T Elon announces, no, we're not going to have this. They're like, okay, I guess right. I got to spend the extra six, $7,000 and, and, and get this, even though it's not really the ideal vehicle. Now I'm feeling a little betrayed. You know, I, 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 sure. I bought that vehicle three months ago. You said you weren't going to sell the vehicle I want, but now you do. So, you know, that's, it's a, it's a little tough there. Welcome yeah, to I, Tesla. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get political because I, you know, we get we get bite-sized bits of news across the Atlantic, uh, but we did get one of your news news briefings yesterday of uh, of your new fella coming in saying words matter, and I, it really struck really struck a chord because to hear someone, you know, a politician saying, look, a, you know, a president's words matter. I would say a CEO's words matter, and that seems right. to be lost in 2020, 2021. Uh, you know, Facebook world, Twitter world. You know, especially putting aside everything that he's done, that Elon Musk has said on Twitter before, the personal attacks, the, you know, certainly those incidents where he's, um, you know, called people names and that's ended up in, in court. Apart from that whole issue of can, a, can the richest man in the world say what the hell he likes and just pay people off or get his lawyers to fix it in court, words matter. And if it was looking like they were going to bring that car out... Tom's absolutely right. You know, you need to treat your customers with respect. Yes. But look, Tesla can do no wrong. Tesla is the the stock that only goes in one direction. So at the minute, they they are absolutely Teflon. They are un, nothing sticks. They are untouchable. Um, oh. And that's just how they work, choose to operate their business. But it's a really good point about choosing to behave in the right way. Right. Well, I'll take the other side of that, Tom. I I, I like to give them the benefit of the doubt, and I, I think. He tends to say what he thinks, and there's not, he doesn't have a lot of filter. And I, or I think maybe at that moment, he was genu genu uh, genuinely thinking that, you know, maybe 250 mile, 244 miles is not going to really cut it. He needs to do better. But then, I don't know, maybe they just realized that, oh, they, they can produce, you know, more volume of vehicles with a limited supply of batteries if they have a small, I don't know what their internal discussions were, but... I, I just like to leave open the possibility that he was actually being genuine there, but you know that's who knows for sure. I I, I will add just a really small point uh, that they over the holiday period released their update to the supercharger map, um, and it's not on the running right. order for today, but it's um right. it's interesting because they've added in loads of of gaps in the U.S. Uh, but around the world as well, and you know I was uh, two hours. To a supercharger that way and i was an hour and 45 to a supercharger in that direction and even you know i'm down on the south coast of uh, of the uk actually maybe an, an hour and a half in that direction but i was nowhere near a supercharger it's certainly a long long way from a service center um right and uh and and what they've put onto their map even around here um brings you know if i was then coming home from a long distance i've now got three or four more supercharging stations that are coming online through the course of 2021 nearer my house on the the main roads around where i am that make wow. a car like this so much m more useful in terms of those those road trips and 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 there's not a big ccs infrastructure in in the uk but certainly if you're going to own a tesla you're looking at the supercharging network and why carry around i know we're in a covid world but why carry around a bigger battery than than you need apart from again bragging rights <laughs> Right, it's fair, especially once uh, charging speeds get up, to, you know, to 250 and above kilowatts, you know, maximum, and hopefully the curves improve as well. All right, so uh, let's move on. Um, so this story popped up late last night as well while I was preparing the show, and it, I thought it could be a pretty big deal, but yeah, maybe not so much. So Apple has been talking with Hyundai about developing an electric car as well as batteries. Uh, before we get too excited, though, here's the official quote. Apple is in negotiations with multiple global automakers. Hyundai is one of them, and we are in early stages of talks. Nothing has been decided. Then they came back. I guess they got some heat, and then they released another statement that totally removed Apple's name at all. And it just says, uh, quote, 
we have been receiving re requests for potential cooperation from various companies regarding development of autonomous EVs. The latest, uh, so no decisions have been made as discussions are in early stage. So Apple was supposed to have something on the road. They're, they have a, uh, a program called uh, Project Titan, and that's going to be that's their electric vehicle program. And it's been going on for a while, but you know, a couple of years ago, I think it was, I think they laid off a whole ton of engineers. And I think a lot of us thought it was done that they just decided to put it on a shelf, but no, it's, it's, they're going forward with that because, you know, the uh, electric vehicle is the ultimate device. Is it not Kyle? Are you an Apple guy? Well, it's certainly the biggest device. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I am an Apple guy. I, I use, I live in the Apple ecosystem. Uh, but I don't know. It, Apple doesn't build anything objectively bad. I don't think everything's really nice, high quality materials, pretty good specs. They're not certainly the best value for a dollar. Uh, but um, I, I think this, if they're going to build a car, it's going to be really solid, uh, have a nice air of quality about it. And uh, honestly, it kind of like if Apple would build a car, I would think it'd be kind of like a Lucid. So we'll see how similar it is. Um, and if they're even talking, I don't know, but that's when I think Apple of cars, I think lucid because it's pretty good quality and great specs. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. I would not, that's not that big a stretch either. You know, man, maybe, you know, really, I think lucid's got really good tech, like their batteries and their, their motors are like the size, the weight, the size and weight, you know, and the power output of them. Man, I don't know about their autonomous tech, but then Apple's got the software to, to do a lot of that. I think that would be a better partner even than than Hyundai, really, because what does, I mean, Hyundai has the eGMP platform coming out, and I guess you know Apple could put a, make a car and set it on top of that, but it's not it's not world class. I, I, I think the Lucid might have an edge there. I don't know. We've seen oh, yeah. difficulty with large automakers partnering with smaller or even other companies because they're just such big behemoths of companies. It's hard to get everyone to talk to each other. I mean, imagine like our cannonball, we, we were trying to coordinate Porsche engineers, Electrify America. This is just Volkswagen Group. And we're having to like be like, oh, do you know this person? No, let's do an introduction. Right. Please make our car charge, uh, you know? <laughs> so so imagine trying to build an EV with a company as large as Hyundai, uh, and Hyundai Kia Group, they're massive, but Lucid's still small, dynamic, they yeah. have the best technology that's at least publicly shown to anyone, uh, yeah. and that might be an easier integration. Again, there's other companies that they could do this with, uh, but that would be, I would think, a pretty natural fit. They're also in the same area, right down the street. Oh yeah? No, it sounds like yeah, a, so Lucid's in uh, in San Jose or or maybe even in Palo Alto. I forget. I've been to their okay. their offices. I can't remember what town, but in Silicon Valley. And Apple's like, you know, it's all pretty much in the same neighborhood. Right, right. I was thinking of the Lucid factory in, I think, Arizona, which is yeah, separate from their headquarters. Martin, any thoughts on this? Are, are you an Apple guy? Yeah, and again, I live in that ecosystem. It's just... <sighs> They never come out with anything until it's it's ready, and and with a few exceptions, they released the their their charging pad, uh, whatever it was going to be called, and it never made its way to the market. But apart from that, they make very few slip ups. They uh, when something's ready, you know, in many ways they're the anti Tesla. Uh, they they keep very quiet. They don't engage in speculation and and rumor. They don't stoke that they let the, the Apple community go and do that, which is, you know, which is less fierce than when Steve Jobs, you know, was around and had those passionate that followers that, that like Elon has as well. But even now, they don't really engage in 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 that. Uh, and they don't need to. And so when they're ready, they'll come out with it. But when they're ready with what um, we don't, you know, we don't know. And the thing is, they're developing. They have said that they are developing self-driving technology. So they won't be make. They don't want to make a car. Well, that's what they've said. They don't want to physically make a car, but they'll provide all of the sensors and hardware and software to make autonomy happen. The thing is, all the other possible partners that they could work with either are doing it or have been doing it a long time and have sunk so much investment into it right. that anyone they work with 
Apple will want to be exclusive, and Apple will want complete control over that walled garden. So if Apple are going to provide autonomy to a, a car maker, perhaps, perhaps there's a Toyota, you know, who aren't a long way down the EV road, who they could who they could work with. But everyone else has spent so much money on that. They're going to have to write that off and just hand that whole piece over to to Apple. Will there be a car with an Apple badge on the front? No. Um, it's a it's a real curious one. Apple don't need to do it either. But they don't need to, but uh, you know, I mean, I don't know how many uh, how many iPads can you sell, you know, it's they have to keep expanding and growing. It's just like the way I don't know. It seems like I, I change my things. I change my phone every year, and then it gets handed down through the family, or up to parents, or down to nieces and nephews. And so, but with cars, it's such a different business. And again, Apple, the way that Apple are moving in terms of software and services, so they are making um, big moves into things like uh, subscriptions, you know, Apple TV and Apple Fitness now, and. Um, uh, the idea of making something like a car just seems to be in such a different direction to where they're going. I mean, the iPhone is still the cash cow, but I, I just have a, a hard time envisioning it personally. All right. Tom, any, any quick thoughts? I'm kind of in Martin's camp. I, I, it always was a little puzzling to me why that they, they would want to do something like this and actually just make their own car rather than the tech that goes in the car or partner with somebody or even if they were going to make their own car, I had thought that they might buy a startup, like, you know, um, approach somebody like a Rivian or a, a Lucid, a company that, you know, seems like they've got some great tech and spent all that legwork doing that. Apple doesn't want to start from scratch and building a platform and everything. I, I, I just, I, I, I still don't see that happening. Like, like Martin said, I don't see a car driving down the road with an apple on the hood, I, I, I know they're doing something in this space. You know, they're they're going to provide right. some sort of mobility services. Um, that's apparent now because there's just so many rumors and so many people are talking about it. But I don't think you're going to see them show up one day at C CES and be like, hey, here's the Apple car. Uh, I, you know, it could be okay. proven wrong, but I, I, I don't think that's going to happen. Oh, interesting. Oh, right on. All right. Um, so let's move on. Um, this next item is of extreme interest to most of our audience, or at least the multimillionaires in the audience. Uh, the Aspark Owl is now on sale in North America. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the Owl, you can see it on your screen here if you're watching this on YouTube. It's an electric supercar from Japan. Only 50 of them will be made, and only 10 of these will be available in North America. Uh, some quick stats, 0 to 60, 1.72 seconds uh, to... 189 miles an hour, which is 300, 300 kilometers per hour, is 10.6 seconds, which is pretty quick once you think about it. Um, so to do all that, it relies on a smallish 64 kilowatt hour battery and has four electric motors that are said to put out a total of 1,985 horsepower and 1,475 pound feet of torque. So that sounds like uh, it's got the right amount of power to get the, get those uh, acceleration numbers. Uh, the price it starts at 2.9 million euros or 3.56 million dollars. Kyle, you have some thoughts about electric supercars? You know, they have not yet excited me that much. Uh, right. And maybe it's because it's just in a whole nother realm of not even ever attainable type thing, you know, but like it doesn't look that great. If I was in the market, I'd buy the Lotus Avaya, I think, because I think mm -hmm. that looks amazing. Uh, look I mean, I, I know Rimac has some of the best technology on the planet, but it's still the styling is is functional. I think a supercar right. needs to be dynamic and expressive. Uh, and, and I don't think the Rimacs have that expressive quality uh, yet, but I think the Avaya, the Lotus Avaya is just, oh, sh I think that hits every nail on the head. Uh, so does this excite me? Not really. Uh, is it going to be impressive? Absolutely. Uh, I have not yet driven one of these electric supercars that might change it for me. But part of the supercar thing for me growing up, you know, the posters on the wall is noise and drama and flames coming out the back. And this just right. seems a little bit too economy car. Like, I'm a big fan of using electrified trend or electrified technology for daily driving so I can then go burn more fuel on the weekends with my loud and fun cars. That's just me. Uh, but you know, 
I don't know. This just doesn't do it for me. I'm sorry. I'm sure the specs are going to be amazing and uh, unfathomable, but that, is anyone really going to experience it? No. That rear view, man. I, I see some like arrow, arrow touches up from like the, the 30s, what, 1930s. Uh, what country does this come from? Uh, Japan. Okay. Hmm. Weird. Yeah, I know it's kind of weird. So we haven't heard about this. You know, the developed usually. You know, you hear about uh, these like supercars. I know, like Remac has been working on theirs for like a long time. Different iterations. It's taken a lot uh, of investment and work and a huge number of engineers to get to this the point where they're at. So it, it's always strikes me as bizarre. Like a car like this can you kind of not appear out of nowhere because we've heard heard about it from years and it's been at auto shows in the past. But still, there's not the uh, any amount of transparency in, into the development process at all. So it's, I mean, it's hard to judge. I think what these cars, this segment of car is missing in the electrified world. And again, keep in mind, I have not driven an electric supercar yet. Uh, I really feel like they're missing a sense of true identity because an electric motor provides power and they all kind of sound the same, but there's right. no real emotional identity when you get behind the wheel there's no startup drama there's nothing and i don't know if that will ever happen with electric mobility but this is part of the flair of supercars technically yes on paper i'm sure this car is better in every way than a combustion powered supercar but the point of a supercar is to be as wild as possible and everything about an electric car is not wild so it, it just doesn't work in my head i guess so i think the my, the, my biggest goal for 2021, and it wasn't really a goal until just now, it, but uh, now my biggest goal for 2021 is to somehow end up in Croatia with you, Carl, and, and Tom, and, or all of us. That'd be great. And at a track with the Remac C2. Let's make it happen. Who knows someone at Remac? If you know uh, someone at Remac in the comments, please reach out and uh, I, let's do an Inside EVs challenge. Which one of us four can get around the track in reverse the fastest? I, actually, I do know Mate a little bit. I've chatted with him. I've met him a few times and uh, I, I've been following him since he was like 18 years old on, on the DIY and what is it? DIY uh, EV forms or whatever. Or, oh, cool. you know, first chatting with people how to, you know, build an electric car and stuff. He was great. Actually, back then, you could tell, like, there was something in him. He's, you know, he wasn't put off by people naysaying what he was doing or, you know, he was just enthusiastic. And he had just, just, oh, man, it, it was just, you could just see the spark in him, you know, just in his writing. It, it could, you know, who really knows what it's going on behind the scenes. But I just, yeah. And he's really, man. It's amazing to see this transformation over the last like dozen years or whatever. I have news and I'm sorry to interrupt. Sure. Did you know that BMW charges $1,990 for a 32 amp home wall box? I did not because know. I, this came up because I'm driving the <laughs> X330e this week. It's just outside my window. I don't know if you, you can't see it too much contrast. Yeah, no. It's just over okay. here. And I was specking okay. out, I'm about to go review it. And uh, I wanted to know how much it costs. 65 grand, by the way. And it says, do you want a charger? It's $2,000. That's, That's just wow. insane. Now, Kyle, I have to ask you a question. They, they, I, don't, I haven't been following their, um, the, their chargers, but I know when they first announced this new wall box, there was going to be two versions of it. And one of them was supposed to communicate with your solar array so that you could set it so that the car only charges while the solar is communicating. That might be that one, and in that case, it's a highly intelligent um, it unit. Say it's anything the main about that. One, um, then it's it, that's incredible that they would charge that for, for that. Um, but you know, the, all the manufacturers, to be honest with you, um, I, I just wish they would almost leave the the home charging equipment to third party vendors because I haven't seen anyone put out a, a charger yet from the manufacturer where it was a good unit and a good value. Uh, some of them are decent units, and the the new Ford uh, um, wall connector seems like it's going to be a nice unit. But it's again, it's it's two or three hundred dollars more than what competing chargers cost. That can do everything that can mm. from third party units. So I know that the manufacturers are trying to figure out ways of having additional revenue, you know, with with the electric right. cars. But you know, they've got to take a different approach. They can't sell a thirty two amp <laughs> wall box. For two grand. <laughs> here's, here's what it says. It says, 
it says that it has been developed using ergonomic high quality design and accentuated by carefully selected green materials. Uh, first off, everything's blue, not green. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it also creates a harmonious appearance with the car. Like oh, yeah. what? It looks super ugly. First of all, I don't know. This is dumb. Sorry to derail our entire podcast. No, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Reset. That's great. That's yeah, true. That's the, the chargers or home charging stations are not an area that manufacturers should be looking to make a few bucks. You know, really, come on, throw it in with a car, even like. Yeah, what you should do is just go to evchargingstations.com. The card should be in the glove box of every car, and then just buy your charger from there. Right? I mean, that's that's what everyone does. I thought. That's I agree with that. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so we were just talking about uh, a super exclusive car. So let's talk about something that's more every man sort of, or every woman. Um, Henrik Fister, Fisker has penned a preview of what he feels a lifestyle electric pickup might look like. Um, it's on their screen there. If you're watching this on YouTube, um, I can see a little bit of the ocean in it. That's the, the that's the name of the crossover that Fisker has contracted with Magna the build. Uh, Tom, does this do anything to you for you, or are you still Cybertruck all the way? So, you know, I read the article, I read what he said that they want to make it the lightest, the most efficient and the most sustainable. I mean, that's just like okay. bullet points that everybody says now, you know, and, and uh, Hendrik, bring us, bring us the ocean and then we'll talk about your, your next endeavor. Um, I think, I think the ocean looks really cool. I, I think, it, you know, it, it actually checks a lot of boxes. It seems like it has a good price. But you know what? We've heard a lot from Hemrick over the years, a lot about where's your solid state batteries that were supposed to be here in 2021 or so. Um, you know, it's it's time to put up. You know, the guy's a fantastic designer. Um, you know, the, his first go around with Fisk Automotive didn't, didn't work out all that well. So, you know, before I start to go looking down the line at your second and third and fourth vehicles, give us your first vehicle and, and let – prove that you can actually do this again. And then we'll look into this. These sketches don't excite me. Maybe you guys feel differently, but you know, when I see these like, well, and, and, and then, you know, it was a, perhaps we'll build this. It wasn't like, take a look right. at what's coming after the ocean. So this is okay. just, Hey, I want to be in the news, get my name out there. I'll uh, somebody mm. put together a sketch so I can tweet something out because Nobody's been talking about us for the last few months. That, that's how I see this. So maybe or, you guys maybe think it sees so. like, or maybe it sees like the popularity of uh, you know the electric pickup. So the discussion around it, you know, booming and and maybe thinks, oh, maybe we can get a piece of that action and throws this out there to, as a sort of see if uh, you know. That, that's what, how what I the, see what it. The crowd says. So yeah. I, I don't want to give right. it all that much oxygen at this point, personally. Sure. <laughs> my okay. my recommendation for any automaker trying to give us your sketch on electric pickup truck make it as useful as possible no one wants a lifestyle truck the subaru baja failed for a reason very cool as it was uh but we really need a workhorse work spec truck think f-150 silverado ram 1500 this is what is everywhere just take right. the same formula and make it electric. Right. We don't need, I'm driving a pickup truck and I'm green. We, we, no, this thing needs to put in work and it's got to tow and it's got to haul and it's got to have right. range while towing. So these are all the things we need out of a truck. We have enough lifestyle trucks coming out. That's true. We do have the, uh, I think the Ford F-150 electric and uh, whatever the Chevrolet version of the Silverado, you know, I think those will be going to be the more traditional vehicles as far as like utility goes. Uh, aside from towing, which is, you know, an, an issue, of course, with electric vehicles. Um, okay, so let's move on, I guess. Um, Tesla has lowered the price for the Made in China Model Y and has started the uh, announced the start of sales there of this. I believe this Model Y has the one-piece uh, thing in the back. And so it's like um, it, eventually at the at uh, Austin, Texas Gigafactory, they're going to be making the Model, model Y, uh, basically like three main components, like a big front section, a back section, and then married you know, to the middle section, which is far different from it's the way that it's always been done. Uh, but this one, I believe, only has the, the one piece in the back. So mm -hmm. the prices now for the Model Y in China are about 30% lower than they were uh, like in the, in, during the summer. Uh, that's 339900 
a yuan, which is uh, equivalent to about fifty-two thousand uh, dollars. So that's about you know the same as what we pay here. So it's interesting to see that. Uh, any thoughts on that? I, I I'm going to be nitpicky, and it's fine. Sure. You can you can tell me off for nitpicky. They haven't lowered the price. They it, haven't it lowered like, the price. No, they they said this is what the car was going to cost, but nobody paid that. Nobody paid that price. So, uh, please again, explain. Yeah, it's just it's just how you would. That's how marketers do their job. They go, hey, we're going to put a car on sale next year. It's going to cost one million dollars, and then when they sell it, oh, it's fifty grand. Oh, oh, wow, it's so much cheaper than you told us. No, so they didn't paid. actually sell any at the no, higher price. They just announced oh. the pricing for the Chinese Model Y, which was extortionate. Oh. I, I forget the original prices. It was mega. It was like it was it was crazy, crazy high. And then okay. when it came out, they went, "Hey, we're lowering the prices." It's See, a, right. it's another example of how great Tesla are at marketing. They dominated that day's news with, "Wow, they've managed to lower the price." They haven't. That nobody paid that price but you know <laughs> once again you know call me cynical whatever i don't mind you can hate me in the comments it was just a cool tactic that they did and they finally put it on price by the way the, the performance model uh at a great price by the way right so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, that's... the difference, difference between like long range performance is like nothing like are they going to sell any long range or regular nah, just, just get performance. Performance? And, uh, and and for the first time ever our wheel options are the same. Model 3s oh, always they? had different wheels. Model Y, oh, cool. same wheels. So yeah, and demand demand looks like it's going to be huge as well. Yeah. So that's you know that's, that's mega. And so they're going to be. It's already you know it's already gone back from you know the estimated delivery time from Q1, Q2. It's now showing Q3. So they're they're selling all the ones they can make. Really good. Right on. All right. So let's hit some other news real quick. Um, so Bentley has uh, presented its new Ben. Pentega hybrid, uh, plug-in hybrid EV. Um, yeah, it looks great. It's a Bentega, whatever. Uh, it's, what's the range on that? Is like 17 miles or something? Or is it <laughs> what I would, it's, it's not a lot. And I, I don't have the specs right in front of me, but we have it on our screen. Yeah, 17.3 kilowatt hour battery, uh, 24.2 miles, you know. So you can get, you know, you can drive and pretty luxurious vehicle on electrons for, for at least a little, little ways. Uh, yeah. So let's move on real quick. T tomorrow, it being tomorrow, well, tomorrow we're recording this on Friday morning. So this tomorrow is Saturday is Neo Day. Actually, there's a whole bunch of things happening, you know, like today and this weekend with CES uh, starting up. But Neo Day is like a really big deal for that brand. And they're going to really, the they've teased this flagship sedan, if you, you can see it on your screen there. And uh, they're going to show it off, I believe, tomorrow. And it's got a massive 150 kilowatt hour battery, which could, could give it as much as 500 miles of range. I'm, I'm guessing, or maybe more. Um, it's uh, let's see, they they did have a a concept called the Preview in 2019, so we think it'll probably look similar to that. Uh, yeah. So I don't know, uh, but if you have no plans for tomorrow, I'm not even sure what time it is. Uh, but I'm sure there'll be replays. Yeah, look up the Neo Day uh, events and see what's going on. Yeah, there's the concept, the preview concept on the screen there. What do you think, Tom? So I'm I'm mad that I'm not going to be there this year. It's funny yeah. thing is, just yesterday I was cleaning up my office and I found this. This is my Neo Day invitation from last year, and uh, it's a really cool event. Uh, Neo rents out like this giant. Um, to make it the equivalent would be like a, a basketball or hockey arena um, in, uh, in, in China. And then they invite all their customers and media and they have this giant celebration. The uh, CEO comes out on stage and they introduce the new, they talk about the past year. They'll introduce a new uh, product like they're doing this year with the sedan. And it, it, the, the, um, the enthusiasm in that arena was like, uh, a sporting event. It right. was crazy. It was, uh, it was, it was really, really a, 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 a tremendous event. And I wish I could be there this year. I actually was invited. They asked me if you could figure out how to get here, you could come, but I don't think I'd have a uh, easy time getting back home to the States. So I passed on it this year. Hopefully I can go next year. Uh, I think it's, uh, I, I, I think Neo's doing all the right things now. They're going to have a 150 kilowatt hour battery option now on top of the 100 kilowatt hour battery option they have. 
they're going all in on long range. Uh, you know, I think that's going to be well. And I, I think that's probably part of the reason why Tesla maybe low uh, that they, they didn't lower the price, but they, when they brought it to market, maybe rethought the price. Now this probably was as Martin mentioned, planned all along by Tesla, you know, would we'll throw out this higher price and then we'll offer it lower, but maybe the pressure from the other um, automakers like Neo and Xpeng, who are putting out some really good products now and, and are gaining popularity, might have forced Tesla to push it down a little bit lower than what they had originally planned to. I mean, we, that's just speculation. But the, the Chinese electric vehicle market is really heating up. What's going on over there right now is we're not experiencing anything like that in here in the U.S. and Europe. Um, I, I really fully believe that they are going to be world leaders in in electrification before yeah. the end of this decade. You know, I think uh, the the products I've seen out of there, I've gotten to, I've driven Neos, I've driven Xpeng cars. Um, these are high quality cars that can compete with the cars that we're producing now, and they're just getting started. These are new oh, yeah. companies. Um, give them four, five, six, seven years of manufacturing experience. Um, you know, I, I think we're what we're going to see is similar to what we saw in the early 70s with Japanese cars, where how they came out of nowhere and it, within a decade, they were like considered, you know, some of the best, most reliable cars and were just selling millions of vehicles around the world. So this is right. th 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 this is this is going to happen. And uh, I think Tesla Tesla has the edge over the other manufacturers because they're getting out ahead of electrification more so than many of the other legacy brands, but China is going to be a force in this market. hundred yeah, percent. I'd love to uh, agree with you here. 100% uh, big fan of everything. I don't know if this has ever happened on the show in show history. I'm agreeing with Tom Malagny. Everything <laughs> he said right there was totally accurate. Uh, and as soon as possible, we're going to be spending some time in China uh, filming and driving some EVs and Tom, you should come over. We got to coordinate this. And if you are in the audience in China and have an electric vehicle that we should be taking a look at, uh, because it's very difficult to coordinate all of them with automakers. But if you have one we can review, let us know. I know we have quite a big China audience here, so it'd be great to uh, have you guys reach out. Maybe we'll meet up and drive your car. That'd be cool. Yeah, interesting sure, sure. thing about um, uh, about <laughs> Neo. Of course, their um, uh, their big thing is battery swapping. How cool would that be? That you do a 150 kilowatt hour battery road trip, drive 500 miles, get to your battery swap station six minutes later as a new fully charged 150 kilowatt hour pack in, and off you go again. It, no, it works in China. It didn't work for Tesla over um, uh, when they tried it, but uh, it's cultural differences. It's really popular in China, and that's like that's cool. That's that's road tripping. Try uh, try a cannonball when it's like right six minutes out battery in go <laughs> I, I did it twice in shanghai i used the battery swap twice and it worked great right on. yeah we will they a... yell at you if you plug in with or if you go there with too high state of charge like what if you pull into a battery swap at 98 percent and then and just like, loop around on, and do another get one on. and it's free <laughs> unlimited like how many can you do before they turn you away I don't, I, I don't on. think they'll turn your way because <laughs> it's easier for them. They get your battery back yeah. and then they can repurpose it like in two minutes. You know, it, it's, yeah. it'll, it, it'll, it'll be charged quickly. So I don't, I don't think they'll complain. You don't get to drive in the battery swap station though. You pull up and there's an attendant there. He backs your car in and oh. pulls it out. So okay. yeah, I didn't so, realize that. Yeah, And you could it's be queued up. Car wash. Yeah, mm. it, it is six minutes, but you could be queued up if there's cars there ahead of you. So Neo recommends that you make an appointment with through your app to say, look, I'm going to be there at two o'clock. And uh, then you have that slot reserved. And from what I understand, a lot of people use that reservation. They don't just show up and it makes it work a lot smoother because, you know, you're scheduled mm. for those few minutes right. right there. And, you know, there could be slight delays. But while I was there, it was just clockwork. It worked. I never had to wait and everybody was just moving and the cars were getting swapped and things were really, and the customers, the Neo customers, many of them told me that I, I spoke with them at Neo day. You know, I was just kind of walking around the audience and um, finding people that could speak English. And they were, they said that the battery swap, many of them said battery swap is the reason why they got the car because in China, very few people have the ability to charge their cars at home. You know, there's right. not, 
very many, you know, private homes. Everybody lives in giant apartment complexes and they don't have the infrastructure to charge their cars there. So you're relying on public infrastructure. And yeah, there are DC fast chargers, but you know, that does take much longer than six minutes. So the battery swap in China, um, while I don't believe it's it's going to really proliferate in the US and Europe, it works in China. Right. Hey, so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but where do uh, people charge their cars generally in China? Do they have like, where do they park? Or, like, how does that work? A lot of people don't have their own houses with garages. So how, how do people park their cars generally? Yeah. So the some of the apartment complexes now are getting more um, char- chargers installed. So you can, you know, trickle charge overnight if you, if you want to call okay. it. They're not as most of them aren't really as high amperage as what we call overnight charging. Uh, but uh, it's public, Dom. It's uh, public infrastructure. They're, they they do have, uh, you know, workplace charging. There's there's chargers in parking lots. Uh, I, we went to a, uh, um, it was like an outdoor, almost like a soccer field. I'm not sure. It was some type of sporting uh, event. I went there with Biden once because they, they had rented the parking lot out to uh, to do test drives of the of their M-Byte. Um, and uh, I noticed there was a row of DC fast chargers that were just installed at this like sp- your sports complex. So, you know, yeah, uh, public places, workplaces, sporting arenas, shopping centers, uh, they're, they're all sprinkled around. All right, cool. Hey, so this isn't what wasn't on our list of things today, but I also noticed last night that uh, Geely, who who does owns Volvo and, and uh, Polestar, they've just they're teaming with Baidu to uh, produce an electric vehicle or probably a line of electric vehicles. So Baidu, which is a huge, but it's like a Twitter kind of thing in China, it's a huge company. Uh, they'll be getting into electric vehicles as well. So, you know, just more of that happening in China, that's going to be big. Um, so uh, we got to wrap it up here pretty quick, but I did want to mention that uh, GM is going to be making, they, they have got to deal with Honda to make a, Honda is going to use their Altium pl- platform to, or Altium, electric infrastructure and battery, I should say the, the platform itself, it, I don't believe is a branded L team. But anyway, they're going to use that to make an electric Honda, but now they're also going to uh, have an electric Acura. So that's going to be a nice to see like a higher end version of this, which will help with, with uh, everything with scale and also get more EVs in the more showrooms. So that's great to see. Um, as well, the Jeep has announced pricing for its Wrangler 4XE plug-in hybrid. So that's like, a, you know, the Wrangler that you see all the time everywhere. You can now get a plug-in version of that. Um, it's going to start the Sahara 4XE version. will start at $47,995 MSRP before the $7,500 tax credit. Um, and after, But after including destination charges and federal tax credit, the effective price will be $41,990, which is about ten grand more than uh, the, the base model and i believe these will have some um both versions so there's the sahara and there's also the wrangler rubicon 4xe which is like at it starts at fifty one thousand six hundred ninety five dollars it'll be 400 or effectively forty five thousand six hundred ninety dollars uh both of these versions though will improve include premium content in addition to the standard features so you're not getting a stripper model at those prices um yeah so we want to hit that, and what else? Really quick, uh, a second all electric Volvo is coming. We'll we'll see that in March. And oh yeah, if you're interested in the first edition of the uh, Volkswagen ID4, they're going to allocate more of those to the U.S. market. They sold out, I think, the first day and back in September when we when they came up on the mark for sale. Uh, that, yeah, they sold out in a day. So I'm not sure if they if this one sold out yet again, but apparently they're we're getting some more of those and those should be coming to us sometime in the first quarter. So you know, looking forward to seeing those in, in person myself and hopefully going for a test drive. Uh, anyone want to say anything about any of those things? What a surprise. Make a good EV. People want to buy it. It's yeah. quite strange, isn't it? Uh, good on VW for doing that. Um, but come on, more, more, more. Well, All right. What I will add to that is, yes, the first edition sold out, but we don't know how many Volkswagen True. made in the first edition. It right. could have been 2,000. You know, I, I, I wish they would have said we made a certain amount, we allocated a certain amount, and it sold out. We have no we have no idea how many it was. So Come that's, on, Volkswagen. What are you afraid of? Tell us. Yeah. 
All right. So that brings us to the end of our show. Um, thank you all for joining us. If you have any comments about any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the Inside EVs podcast post, the YouTube comment section, or on the Inside EVs forum podcast thread. Uh, don't forget you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Tom is at Tomalog. Uh, Martin is at EV News Daily. Uh, nice. And Kyle Connor is at Out of Spec. And I'm at Dominic underscore Y. Um, click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. We'll see you all next week. Ciao. <laughs>